Namaste. When I was coming from India to Stockholm, this is gentleman sitting next to me. And he asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm an anti-trafficking activist. So he said, where are you going? I said, Stockholm. I said, very good. That's the right place. You know, there's a lot of traffic problem there too. <laughs> And you must do some comparative study and find some good solutions. <laughs> Took me a little while to explain to him that I don't work on the red light, green light, and all that. Maybe red light, but not the <laughs> green light. Um, I work on one of the worst forms of human rights violation. I work on the issue of sex trafficking. I'd like to tell you the story of Minu. Minu is nine years old. When she was four years old, she's an orphan. When she was four years old, her maternal aunt took her as a help in this tea stall that she was running in the highway. At the age of five, Minu was sold for prostitution. For the next three years, Minu's flesh was used by hundreds of men to satisfy their libido, for their pleasure. She was scarred, tortured, beaten. And one day, when she developed acute psychotic depression, she was dumped on the road. That is where we found her. Minu is part of the millions of women and children who get sold for prostitution. It's estimated that every 10 minutes, there's a person, there's a human being who's getting sold for some purpose. Maybe for adoption, in the name of adoption. Maybe in the name of organ trade, maybe in the name of beggary, maybe in the name of circus, maybe in the name of sweatshop, anything and everything for exploitation. Minu is a part of those millions of people who get trafficked. But the kind of trafficking that she got trafficked to, that's prostitution, in my opinion, is one of the worst forms because it completely demolishes the mind, body, and the soul of a person. And very, very funnily enough, although this crime this form of slavery is perhaps one of the oldest form in the world. Yet, the perception and attitude about it is so naive. Whether it is because we don't want to know about it or whether we just want to block it. But a century old problem across the world, we're still talking about what is it? How does it happen? What happens inside? Another dimension of this problem is also that, apart from the fact that it is a crime and all the nasty things about it, we, the world at large, we have severe issues about it. We have mental blocks. We have attitudinal issues. We have perception issues about this problem. No crime, no other crime in the world, you will have a victim victimized so much as much in the crime of sex trafficking. Her isolation, her marginalization, her complete removal from the society as a misfit, as an outcast. She's branded, she's called all kinds of names, she's a war, she's a harlot, she's anybody but somebody who can belong to the society. In many ways, I understand that isolation and marginalization. At the age of 16, I was gang raped by eight men. For me, the rape per se of having eight men all over my body was not so bad. What was even worse was the snide comments 
the nasty commons. We lived in a colony where people actually told their children, don't talk to her because she's a characterless person. She has got loose morals. For two years, I was ostracized. I was isolated from my world. The school I attended, nobody would sit in the bench that I sat because I was a person with loose character. We, as civil society, we have, as global citizen, we take great pride in many things, but we also are collectively responsible for marginalizing victims of sexual violence. And when it comes to sex traffic victims, it's far, far more acute because we don't even understand the journeys that they have gone through. Most victims of sex trafficking come from very different optionless background. It could be poverty. It could be a dysfunctional family. It could be incest. It could be consumerism. A different kind of optionlessness, something that makes you vulnerable, that, something that makes you feel that I have to escape from this reality. I need to go to some other place. And in that kind of a space, in that kind of a context, somebody comes and says, I love you. Or somebody comes and says, I'll give you a job. Or I'll get married to you. I'll make you a heroine. I'll, make you, I'll give you a film role. I'll make you a model. You just grab it. You jump. You go with this person. 95% of sex trafficking happens through deception and fraudulent means. Hardly very few percentages of coercion or kidnap. Most of it is through deception. Most victims of trafficking have no clue when they go what they're going for. They think their reality is going to change. They think everything is going to become hunky-dory once they reach there. But only when they reach there, they realize there's no job, there's no marriage, there's no love, there's no boyfriend. You have to sleep with 10 or 15 men a day. I have rescued more than 6,000 women and children in my lifetime. And till date, <laughs> and till date, I have not met one single child, one single woman who has told me that when I was told this is not a job and I had to sleep with 10 men, I very happily agreed to it. Most victims say, no, no, I don't want to do this. More you say no to it, more torture is inflicted on you. An eight-year-old child that we rescued from a place called Isgoa told us that she was kept in a room with a snake, beaten black and blue everywhere except for a vagina, till she said, stop, I'll do what you want me to do. Another child, a 13-year-old child, said they took a razor blade, a very thin razor blade, and kept cutting it here, till she said, stop, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Many people go through irreversible consequences. Acids are thrown on their faces, they're disfigured for a lifetime. The more you resist, more such torture is inflicted on you. There are also victims, unheard of, disposed of quietly, because they've resisted so much that they were killed in a brothel. But most of them give in to the pressure. They don't realize when they're giving into the pressure because they want to get that immediate torture ended. They don't realize when they say yes, they're actually saying yes to a lifetime of exploitation. Because prostitution, flesh trade, sex trafficking is about exploitation. It's ex about exploitation from the hundreds of people who live on your earning. There's a pimp, there's a madam, there's a financer, there's a goon, there's a policeman, there's a lawyer. All these people live on the earnings of this person, which means that this person cannot say, 
today is a day for vacation, I want to take a vacation. Or today is Christmas or it's Midsummer Eve, I want to take a holiday. I want to relax. Or today I don't have the mood, I can't do it. You like it or not, you have to sleep with 15 to 20 men a day. What is the profile of the men you're talking about? Are these men who are coming here to make you your wife or have courtship with you or have some kind of accountable relationship with you? No. These are men who are buying you for an hour, two hours, one night at the most. And the predominant thought process in this man's mind is I can do whatever I want with this body. Every victim that we rescue tells us one common story about that customer, about that John who put chili powder in the vagina or took a cigarette and burned her or took a belt and bet her up or tied her to the bedpost and had sex with her. Every single one of them will tell you about one story a day. But what do we think, we who are sitting outside here, we think this is about easy money. We think this is lucrative. You know, these are all shortcut methods of earning. They don't want to work. How easy is prostitution? How lucrative is prostitution? Most sex traffic victims across the world are in a debt trap for a debt that they have never, ever taken. She would be from Romania coming to Stockholm. Her passport is with the trafficker. Whatever money is spent from bringing her from Romania to Stockholm becomes a principal debt amount. She's 12, she's 13 years old. No man will wear a condom to have sex with her. And therefore, the consequences of unprotected sex with her would be in pregnancy. Pregnancy is not allowed in prostitution. So you want an abortion. You go to, for an abortion to a general hospital or a proper physician or to a nursing home, the doctor will ask you, what are these marks on the body? Who's done this to your vagina? Who's done this on your body? And therefore, you prefer a quack. You pay, say, $5,000 for a normal abortion. You pay $25,000 for an abortion with a quack. That goes into your debt. So every day, you're sleeping with five and 10 and 15 men a day, not earning a pie, because you're clearing your debt. And the extra bonuses that you get in this journey is the sexually transmitted infections, the venereal diseases, the traumatic brain injuries, the addictions, the drugs, the alcohol, the physical abuse, the torture, and then this person gives up after a little while. She gives up for two reasons. One, because the trafficker tells her, her perpetrators tell her that you can't escape this place. Anywhere you go, we'll bring you back here. The trafficker is a fraud. The trafficker is a criminal. The trafficker is a liar. But in this matter, the trafficker is 250% true. Because even if she was to come out, all of us will not allow her to come back. We as civil society, we as states, we as systems, we as governments, we as people, we have individuals, our attitudes and perceptions will not allow us to take her back in. In the, in the country like the United States of America, till date, girls as young as 11 and 12 in prostitution are arrested and detained. She is an accused. She's a criminal. That is the kind of space we give her to come out. We completely block from her coming out. And she knows that. She knows even if I come out, all of us are not going to allow her in. We will not, our police stations are not open for it, our courts are not open for it, our hearts are not open for it. 
and then she decides, okay, this is my fate, this is what I want to do, and then she starts normalizing the exploitation. She starts believing, having 15 men a day, getting raped 15 times, 20 times a day, is the most normal thing in life, and being out of it, very abnormal. And then what happens? A few years later, the trafficker says, you've been six years now, you came at the age of 12, now you're 18, you're doing well, now your debt is cleared, okay, $100. First time she sees his money at the age of 18. At the age of 19, the trafficker comes back again, says, you've got $100 now, you can make it $100,000 actually. Why don't you go back to Romania and get two more girls? And now, this girl goes back to Romania, very nicely dressed, jing bang, very prosperous looking, very rich looking, and she says, I was in Sweden, I was working there, I've got a nice job. You know, there are two more vacancies. She's not a stranger. She's not an outsider. She's our own girl. And she takes two more girls back to Sweden. A victim slowly becoming a perpetrator of crime. Why? Who made her this criminal? Two years later, she thinks, why am I supplying two, two girls to this person? I may as well become a trafficker myself. Most victims of trafficking don't have an exit. Hardly 7% of victims of sex trafficking get ever rescued across the world. Across the world, we're talking about hardly 7% of them ever getting rescued. 93% of them are still in those hell holes. Most of them die an untimely death. It's time to discard with HIV AIDS and things like that. It is in this kind of a world that I work, this kind of human beings that I have given my life to. And one of the things that I realized in my own life, when I was ostracized, I was isolated, I was marginalized, was deep inside my pain, there was a lot of power lot of strength. I chose not to be a victim. I said, balls, these are the men who did something to me. I'm not wrong. They are wrong. I chose that. And when I chose that, I realized there is a power in me which can withstand anything. And when I realized that power, I took the journey that I took. And that is the same philosophy we have used to work with all these girls, making them understand behind the layers, beneath the layers and layers of pain that they carry, there's a huge volcano of power, which they can see. All the pictures of the girls that you're seeing are sex survivors of sex trafficking, who are now working as welders and carpenters in very unconventional fields. But what we do with them is to make them see their self, understand their self. I don't know when the world will change, when all of you all will change your minds about sex traffic victims, and I don't care when you change or you don't change. But what I care is whether this victim can stop thinking about your validation, your acceptance, your compassion. She can believe in her own compassion, her own validation, and her own self. And when we put her on a journey to seek herself, she slowly starts gaining confidence, and then she starts believing in dignity. And one of the greatest miracles that I have seen is when she starts gaining that self, she affirms faith, faith in herself, faith in the world around her. And which is so, for me, it's absolutely a miracle. This child whom you see here has been in prostitution for more than a year and a half. That means around 450 days. 450 into 
10 customers. You're talking about at least 4,500 men raping this child. Yet, she has the grace to smile. Yet, she embraces life. And we, all of us, you know, small incidents in our life, small betrayals, small disappointments can make us cynical for a lifetime. This person, who has much more reason to be cynical, does not ever become cynical. And she believes in that hope. Not only does she cherishes the power, she's alive. She doesn't breathe and she doesn't live. She's alive because she is knowing herself. She's in commune with herself. And one of the greatest qualities I've seen among these people, which for me is so beautiful, it gives me so much of strength, is the capacity, the generosity of the spirit to give back to the world. You know, we talk about giving back when we are privileged, you know. These children, these girls, have the generosity of the spirit to give back even if they have nothing in their hand to do it. Every time there is a natural calamity in India, every time, time there is a communal riot, every time there is a flood, my children in my shelter are the first ones to come and give their best clothes for the day. Madam, flood and lay, can you give these clothes there? My children have only just four pairs of clothes, and they bring out the best among the four and give it to us, saying that, can you send this to lay because children there don't have clothes to wear? Where do you see such generosity of spirit? I want to remind you again of Minu. As Minu slowly takes back life in her, in her hand, she came to me just 10 days before I came here to Stockholm. I have only one thing to ask, because I'm not just Sunita Krishnan. I'm also the voice of the hundreds and millions of victims and survivors that I represent. We need to respond. We need ways to act. I say this every time in every other forum that I go. Let us not think about the million ways that we cannot do it. Can we think about that one way that we can do it? Can we break our silence? Can we break our silence on this issue, maybe starting with our own families? Can we break our silence about, say, incest within our families? Because every time we are silent about a father raping a daughter, about a brother abusing his sister, we actually promote a perpetrator. Because a man who thinks that he can do with his daughter and get away with it, thinks he can do it with anybody else, any child, anywhere in the world. Can we break our silence about it? Can we break our silence and tell the story to two more people? Convince them to tell them to another two people? Can we be a part of that collective world which does not tolerate violence of any kind against any human being? We need to respond. We need to respond because no child, no woman, no human being deserves what this child has gone through. Thank you so much.